Devotees, welcome to day 75 of our Bhakti Vaibhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 3. We are in the uh, 26th chapter of the third canto and we're going to continue on from verse 19. But first of all, let us chant our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shamadi Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharani Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Chadi Shatani Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhanacha Ananda Sri Advaiti Gadatha Shivas Adi Gaura Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchakapa Charubias Cha, Kripa Sindhu, Bhya Eva Cha. Padidanam Pavane, Bhya Vaishnava, Bhya Namo Namaha, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Here we go. Verse 19. After the Supreme Personality of Godhead impregnates material nature, with his internal potency, material nature delivers the sum total of the cosmic intelligence, which is known as Hiran Maya. This takes place in material nature when she is agitated by the destinations of the conditioned souls. Okay, so let's have a look at the purport here. There's a fairly substantial purport here. So Srila Prabhupada makes the point that this impregnation of material nature is described in Bhagavad Gita, 14th chapter, verse 3, which says, this is the translation, the total material substance called Brahman is the source of birth. And it is that Brahman that I impregnate, making possible the births of all living entity of all living beings, O son of Bharata. Right, so that's the verse, Bhagavad Gita chapter 14, verse 3, which is describing this impregnation of material nature, which is described here in verse 19. So, Prabhupada goes on, material nature's primal factor is the Mahatattva, or breathing source of all varieties. And, well, just my note, primal factor means what divides into the subject without leaving a remainder. For example, four is a primal factor of 12, because 12 divided by four equals exactly three. There is no remainder after the division. But for example, if we were to say five, five is not a primal factor of 12, because 12 divided by 5 equals, what is it, um, 2.4, something like that. Yeah, 2.4. There's a remainder. There's a remainder. Yeah, 5 into 12 is 2 would be 10, but then there's 2 left over. So primal factor means what divides into something uh, without leaving a remainder. I hope that's sort of clear enough, you know, and it's a bit of a technical point of grammar or whatever. 
Okay, so on we go. So this part of material nature, Prabhupada says, which is called Pradhan. We've been reading and talking about Pradhan. Pradhan, as well as Brahman, is impregnated by the Lord and then delivers varieties of living entities. And Prabhupada says the material nature in this connection is called Brahman because it is a perverted ref reflection of the spiritual nature. So then Srila Prabhupada goes on with the second paragraph, Vishnu Purana says the living entities belong to the spiritual nature, Vishnu Purana, Bhagavatam and so many other um, literatures say that the living entities belong to the spiritual nature, of course, Bhagavad Gita. So the potency of the Lord is spiritual and the living entities, even though they're called marginal potency, they, they're actually spiritual, but it's just they have marginal tendencies. That's what it is. But in nature, they're spiritual. So, you know, if they were not spiritual, this description of the impregnation by the Lord would not be applicable. Because the Lord doesn't put his semen into that which is not spiritual. You know, the Lord, of course, classically, he really has nothing to do with uh, anything material. But anyway, so that's the case normally. But here it's stated that the Supreme Person puts his semen into material nature. This means that the living entities are spiritual by nature. So after impregnation, material nature delivers all kinds of living entities from Brahma down to the end. And Srila Prabhupada now refers to Bhagavad Gita, chapter 14, verse 4, that the material nature is said to be Sarva Yonishu, means all species have material nature as mother and the Supreme Lord is the seed-giving father. So, and Prabhupada explains, Generally, it's found that the father gives life to the child, but the mother gives body, although the seed of life is given by the father. The body develops within the womb of the mother. So similarly, spiritual living entities impregnated into the womb of material nature. But the bodies being supplied by material nature take on many different species and forms of life. So, Prabhupada makes the point that the theory that the symptoms of life manifest by the interaction of 24 material elements is not supported here. But rather, the living force comes directly from the Lord and is completely spiritual and therefore, no material scientific advancement can produce life. The living force comes actually from the spiritual world and has nothing to do with the interaction of the material elements. So on we go, devotees, to verse 20. Thus, after manifesting variegatedness, the effulgent Mahatattva, which contains all the universes within itself, which is the root of all cosmic manifestations, and which is not destroyed at the time of annihilation, swallows the darkness that covered the effulgence at the time of dissolution. So there's a shortish purport here. Prabhupada makes the point that, first of all, since the Lord is ever existing, all blissful and full of knowledge. His, his different energies are also ever existing 
in the dormant stage. <laughs> so when the Mahatattva is created, it manifested material ego and swallowed up dark, the darkness which covered the material world at the time of dissolution. So Prabhupada then further explains this idea. It's a little, anyway, it may not be so easy for some to grasp that a person at night is inactive because being covered by the darkness of night. But when the same person is awakened in the morning, then the covering of night or the forgetfulness of the sleeping state disappears. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, similarly, when the Mahatattva appears after the night of dissolution, the effulgence is manifested to exhibit the variegatedness of this material world. On to verse 21. The mode of goodness, which is the clear, sober state, status of understanding the personality of Godhead, and which is generally called Vasudeva or consciousness, becomes manifest in the Mahatattva. So there's another fairly pretty extensive purport here. Let's have a look. So the Vasudev state, Vasudev manifestation, or the status of understanding the Lord is, is called pure goodness, Shuddha Sattva. And in that stage, in that state, in that stage, in that status, that none of the other qualities, neither of the other qualities, passion or ignorance, ne neither of them are there at all. They're completely absent. In the Vedic literature, there's mention of the Lord's expansion as, as four, Chaturvyuha, Vasudev Sang Sangashan Prajuna and Aniruddha, so here, when the Mahatattva reappears, these four expansions of Godhead appear. And Prabhupada says, he who is seat seated within as super soul expands first as Vasudev. So the Vasudev state, well, onto the second paragraph, this Vasudev state is free from any infringement by material desires and it's the status the position in which one can understand the Lord or the objective which is described in in Bhagavad Gita as Ad Bhuta. This is another feature of the Mahatattva. So the the Vasudeva expansion is also called Krishna consciousness, hmm. as it's free from rajas and tamas, as we just mentioned. And this clear state, because you see, it's in such a pure state that the awareness is just complete and completely accurate. Because there's, there's no passion, there's no ignorance to sort of confuse the the understanding. So, therefore, in that state, one can, can understand the Lord. So the Vasudev state is also explained in Bhagavad Gita as Shetragya, the knower of the field of activities, as well as the super-knower. The living entity, of course, as we've discussed, the living entity within the body knows the body. We know our bodies, but the super knower, Vasudev, knows all bodies. Hmm. That's really completely different. 
So therefore, to be situated in Krishna consciousness, one must worship Vasudev. And Vasudev is Krishna alone. Yeah, without, without the accompaniment of his internal energy. Gee, that's interesting, isn't it? And he's called Dwarakadish. So Prabhupada explains that Bhagavad Gita explains that after many births, one surrenders to Vasudev, and such a great soul is very rare. Then the third paragraph, in order to get release from false ego, one has to worship Sankarshan. Sankarshan is also worshipped through Lord Shiva. And interesting point, the snakes which cover the body of Lord Shiva are representations of Sankarshan. And Lord Shiva is always absorbed in meditation upon Sankarshan. So therefore, Prabhupada makes the point, one who is a worshipper of Shiva as a devotee of Sankarshan can be released from false ego. Mm, it's deep. It's very deep. So anyway, Prabhupada continues, if you want to get free from mental disturbances, you have to worship Aniruddha. So in order to do that, worship of the moon planet is also recommended in the Vedic literature. So similarly, Prabhupada says, uh, to be fixed in one's intelligence, one has to worship Pradyumana, who is reached through the worship of Brahma. And these things are explained in Vedic literature, and I must admit it is a bit on the sort of profound side and not so easy to really wrap one's head around completely. So anyway, verse 22. After the manifestation of the Mahatattva, these features appear simultaneously as water in its natural state before coming in contact with earth is clear, sweet and unruffled. So the characteristic traits of pure consciousness are complete serenity, clarity and freedom from distraction. Sure. So Prabhupada makes the point, pure consciousness, Krishna consciousness, exists in the beginning, just after creation. At that point, consciousness is not polluted. But the more one becomes materially contaminated, the more the consciousness becomes obscured. And in pure consciousness, one can perceive, Prabhupada says, a slight reflection of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as in clear, unagitated water, free from impurities, uh, as in that water like that, one can see everything clearly. So in pure consciousness or Krishna consciousness, one can see things as they are. It just reminds me of an interesting experience. Quite some years ago, like 20 or even more, I visited Baikal, Lake Baikal in Siberia, Russia. And the particular part of the lake is completely, I mean, as close to completely pure water as I think it's possible to get. And there you can look down like meters and meters into the water and see the bottom clearly. I mean, many meters, it's really quite something. So yeah, so like that, one can see the reflection of the Lord and see one's own existence. 
And Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, this state of consciousness is very pleasing, transparent and sober. In the beginning, consciousness is pure. So on we go, verses 23 and 24 are uh, together. The material ego springs up from the Mahatattva, which evolved from the Lord's own energy. The material ego is endowed predominantly with active power of three times, three kinds. Take a guess what three kinds? Goodness passion and ignorance. It is from these three types of material ego that the mind, the senses of perception, the organs of action and the gross elements evolve. So we're just now in the last verse and purport, we're talking about how things were right in the beginning of the creation. So this is continuing that point that in the beginning from clear consciousness or Krishna consciousness, the first contamination arose. This is called false ego, identifying the body as the self. So in, in our natural state, the living entity is Krishna conscious. In, in our natural state, but we've got marginal independence and this allows us, you could say, to forget Krishna. So this, this opportunity, this, cha this chance, uh, this chance of forgetting Krishna happens through the misuse of our minute independence. So this is exhibited in, in actual life, Prabhupada says, and, and there are many instances, there are many examples in which someone who's acting in Krishna consciousness, they, some, they sometimes change, they suddenly change and means they give up Krishna consciousness or somehow they become attached to something else and their Krishna consciousness reduces dramatically. And so the Upanishads, Prabhupada says, they state that the, the path of spiritual realization is just like the sharp edge of a razor. I'm sure any of you gentlemen, you know what that means who amongst men who has not cut themselves shaving, my gosh. Yeah. So then on to the second paragraph, not only must we become Krishna conscious, but we have to be very careful. Any inattentiveness, carelessness can cause fall down. And that would be due to false ego somehow or other. Um, some attachment to the body manifests and we become attached to it and then we forget Krishna. So therefore, from the status of pure consciousness, the false ego is born from where, how? Because of misuse of independence. And Prabhupada makes the point, we can't argue how did it happen? that uh, how did false ego, why did false ego come from pure consciousness? But the point is, Prabhupada says, factually there's always the chance that this will happen. Therefore one has to be very careful. So in general though, false ego is the basic principle for all material activities which are going on in the modes of material nature. So as soon as one deviates from pure Krishna consciousness, he increases his entanglement 
in material reaction. Prabhupada con concludes the purport by saying, the entanglement of materialism is the material mind. And from this material mind, the senses and material organs become manifest. So on we go to verse 25. The threefold ahankara, the source of the gross elements, the senses and the mind, is identical with them because it, ahankara, is their cause, the cause of the gross elements, the senses and the mind. So it, Ahankara, is known by the name of Sankarshan, who is directly Lord Ananta with a thousand heads. And there's no purport here. So we go on to verse 26. This false ego is characterized as the doer, as an instrument, and as an effect. It is further characterized as serene, active, or dull, according to how it is influenced by the modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. So, what's stated here? Well, what's stated here? In, in the purport, at least, Prabhupada says, Ahankara, false ego, is transformed into the demigods. And as an instrument, the false, the false ego is represented as different senses and sense organs. And as a result of the combination of the demigods and the senses, material objects are produced. So in the material world, of course, so many things are being produced and that's generally called advancement of civilization. But actually, it's just a manifestation of false ego. By false ego, all material things are produced as objects of enjoyment, yes, not objects to be engaged in the Lord's service. So basically though, we have to stop increasing artificial necessities in the forms of material objects. Uh, Naratam Das Thakur, Prabhupada quotes, he is lamented that when one deviates from pure Krishna consciousness, he becomes entangled in material activity. And Prabhupada says the exact words that Naratam Das Thakur uses are Satsanga Chadi Kainu Asate Vilas Te Karena Lagila Ye Karma Banda Pans which means I have given up the pure status of consciousness because I wanted to enjoy in the temporary material manifestation. Therefore, I've been entangled in the network of actions and reactions. Hmm. Yes, okay. So, verse 27. From the false ego of goodness, another transformation takes place. From this evolves the mind whose thoughts and reflections give rise to desire. So Prabhupada begins the purport by saying, the symptoms of the mind are determination and rejection, which are due to different kinds of desires determination, meaning, well, desires, really, <laughs> acceptance, acceptance and rejection. So 
Prabhupada continues, we, we desire that which is favorable to our sense gratification and we reject things not favorable for it. So in this way, the material mind is not fixed. But when the same mind, uh, or, or rather the same mind, mind can be fixed when engaged in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise on the material level, the mind hovers, it hovers and hovers. And all this rejection and acceptance is asat, temporary. Yeah, that right at the beginning of the purport, Prabhupada said the symptoms of the mind are determination and rejection. So that determination is essentially acceptance. Yeah. And then rejection. So however advanced a person is academically, as long as he's not fixed in Krishna consciousness, he'll simply accept and reject. Yeah. And he'll never be able to fix his mind on, on any particular subject matter. And this is very important information. This is very important information. Yeah, and this is why people on the material level, they're just so splayed out. They're so splayed out. Going this way, then going that way. They don't know whether they're coming or going. Right, so on we go to verse 28. The mind of the living entity is known by the name of Aniruddha, the supreme ruler of the senses. He possesses a bluish black form resembling a lotus flower growing in the autumn. He is found slowly by the yogis. So, okay, there's a short purport here, fairly short. Yoga, the system of yoga entails controlling the mind and the Lord of the mind is Aniruddha. Aniruddha has four hands with Sudarshan Chakra, Conchal Club and Lotus Flower. And Prabhupada goes on that, well, anyway, all these Yogis, the yogis, uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada says, states that Aniruddha particularly is worshipped by the yogis. So, um, meditation, we shouldn't meditate on anything impersonal or void. It's just a modern invention of the over fertile brain of some speculator. But actually this, this yoga med meditation as described, prescribed in this verse, should be fixed on the form of Aniruddha. And if we, if we do fix our mind on Aniruddha, then we'll become freed of acceptance and rejection. <laughs> yes. And Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, when one's mind is fixed upon Aniruddha, one gradually becomes God-realized. He approaches the pure status of Krishna consciousness, which is the ultimate goal of yoga. So on we go, devotees, to verse 29. Um, Intelligent. By, by transformation of the false ego in passion, intelligence takes birth, O virtuous lady. The functions of intelligence are to help in ascertaining the nature of objects when they come into view and to help the senses. Okay, that's interesting. So, intelligence... Prabhupada explains, intelligence is the discriminating power to understand an object 
and it helps the senses to make choices. What shall we enjoy? Shall we enjoy this or that? So that intelligence helps the senses make these choices and therefore intelligence is meant to be the master of the senses. And the perfection of intelligence is attained when you, you become fixed in activities in Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, by the proper use of intelligence, one's consciousness is expanded. And the ultimate expansion of consciousness is Krishna consciousness. Okay, on we go to verse 30. Doubt, misapprehension, correct apprehension, memory and sleep, as determined by their different functions, are said to be the distinct characteristics of intelligence. This is quite something, isn't it? This is quite a description. Yeah. So Prabhupada makes the point, very important point, that doubt is one of the important functions of the intelligence. Blind acceptance of something is not, doesn't really show that you've got intelligence. Therefore, the word samshaya is very important. Samshaya means doubt. To cultivate intelligence, one should be doubtful in the beginning. But, but uh, still, when information is received from the proper source, then doubting is not favorable. That's very important. And to drive this point home, Prabhupada says at the end of this paragraph, in Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says, that doubting the words of the authority is the cause of destruction. Hare Krishna. That's very powerful, isn't it? So on to the second paragraph of the purport. Uh, Prabhupada refers to Pat the Patanjali Yoga system, and he quotes some Sanskrit there, which means... By intelligence only, one can understand things as they are. And by intelligence only, can you understand whether you're this body or not? So this study to determine whether one's identity, whether one is spirit or matter, it begins with doubt. And when you're able to actually, to, to analyze your actual position, then the false identification with the body is detected. Yeah. And this is called, Srila Prabhupada says, Viparyasa, which means, it's in the verse at the end of the first line, misapprehension. So when the false identification is detected, then real identification can be understood. At least it can be the beginning to come to, to that point of real identification. So the real understanding is described here as nishchaya, nishchaya, correct apprehension. That's also from the verse, nischaya, is uh, the first term in the second line of the Sanskrit of the verse 30. Right. So yeah, nischaya is correct apprehension, which you can take to mean uh, proved, proven, experimental knowledge. 
So Prabhupada explains this experimental knowledge can be achieved when one has understood the false knowledge, Krishna. So by the experimental, Prabhupada concludes the paragraph, by experimental or proved knowledge, uh, one can understand that he's not the body, but his spirit soul. And we go on into the third paragraph here, shortish. Smriti, smriti means memory. And swapna, swapa means sleep. Smriti is memory, swapa is sleep, right? So sleep, interesting, important point. Sleep Sleep is also necessary to keep the intelligence working. Yeah. If you don't get enough sleep, then you start getting spaced out generally after a while. And you start becoming less functional and less sort of functionally focused. So, yeah. Yeah, Prabhupada says, if there's no sleep, the brain cannot work nicely. So Bhagavad Gita, of course, there's famous verse, which says that people who regulate eating, sleeping and other necessities of the body in the proper proportion, proportion become very successful in yoga practice. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, these are some of the aspects of the analytical study of intelligence as described in both the Patanjali Yoga system and the Sankhya philosophy system of Kapila Dev in Srimad Bhagavatam. So on we go to verse 31. Egoism in the mode of passion produces two kinds of senses, the senses for acquiring knowledge and the senses of action. The senses of action depend on the vital energy and the senses for acquiring knowledge depend on intelligence. Okay, Prabhupada states that in the previous verses, it's been stated that the mind is the product of ego in goodness and its function is acceptance and rejection according to desire. Well, we read that, didn't we? What is it? Previous verse or a or couple of verses ago. So now here though, intelligence is said to be a product of ego and passion that that's the distinction between mind and intelligence um, and Prabhupada um, makes the point that mind is a product of egoism in goodness so so yeah so anyway the desire to accept something and reject something is a very important factor of the mind. And since the mind is a product of goodness, then if it's, if it's fixed on the Lord of the mind, Aniruddha, then the mind can be changed to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada refers to Naratam Das Thakwa. We always have desires. Desire cannot be stopped. But if we transfer our desire to Krishna, that is the perfection of life. Transfer our desires to the desire to please Krishna. That's the perfection of life. But as soon as desire is transferred to lording it over the material nature, that means contamination. It becomes contaminated by matter. So the thing is, desire has to be purified. In the beginning, Prabhupada says, 
by the order of the spiritual master or by following the orders of the spiritual master. So therefore, by practice, one comes to goodness and by surrender, one becomes a great person. Surrender, by surrendering to the Lord, fixing the mind on the Lord, one becomes a very great personality, Prabhupada says, a Mahatma. Samahatma Sudulabaha from Bhagavad Gita 7.19. It's very clearly said, such a great soul is very rare. Right, so we go on to the second paragraph here. And Prabhupada makes the point that it's clear that both types of senses, senses for acquiring knowledge and the senses for action, are products of egoism in the mode of passion. Uh, and because, because these sense organs require energy, then the life energy is also produced by egoism in passion. So, and Prabhupada makes the point, we see that those who are very passionate can acquire material things quickly. And Prabhupada says, in the Vedic scriptures, it's said that if you want to encourage a person in acquiring material things, then uh, you should encourage the person in sex life. And, and we find, often we find, those who are addicted to sex life are also materially advanced because sex life is such an impetus for material advancement of civilization. But, but for those, for those who want spiritual advancement, there's almost no mode of passion. Basically, only goodness is prominent. And therefore, we find that those who are engaged in Krishna consciousness materially, they may be poor. But if you have the eyes to see more clearly, then you can see uh, who is greater. Someone, someone who's into sex life and materially advanced or someone who's into spiritual advancement, yeah, like that, and maybe even materially poor. So, but the point is that even though the devotee um, appears to be materially poor, the devotee is not actually poor, but rather the person who has no taste for Krishna consciousness and, and seems happy with material possessions, is actually poor. Um, and, and Prabhupada makes an interesting point that people infatuated by material consciousness are very intelligent in discovering things for material comforts, but they have no access uh, to spiritual life, to understanding the spiritual soul or understanding spiritual life. So therefore, if you want to advance spiritually, you have to come to the level of purified desire, which means the, purif the desire for devotional service. And Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, as stated in the Narada Pancharatra, Engagement in the service of the Lord when the senses are purified in Krishna consciousness is called pure devotion. Verse 32. When egoism and ignorance is agitated by the sex energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the subtle element sound is manifested. And from sound come the ethereal sky and the sense of hearing. So there's pretty substantial purport here. 
Yeah. Prabhupada makes the point that it appears from this verse that all the objects of sense gratification are products of egoism in ignorance. So it's understood here that by agitation of the element of egoism in ignorance, the first thing produced was sound, which is the subtle form of ether. Vedanta Sutra says sound is the origin of all objects of material possession. And by sound, one can dissolve material existence. Anavriti Shabdat, which is not in the verse, but anyway, it's a Sanskrit term. It means liberation by sound. So that the whole material creation began from sound, and sound can also end material entanglement. Yes. The, the, well, the particular sound that can do that is transcendental sound, Hare Krishna. Yeah. And our entanglement in material affairs, affairs has begun from material sound. Now we have to purify that sound spiritually. And of course, there's sound in the spiritual world also. Yeah. And if we approach that sound, spiritual sound, our spiritual life begins. Uh, and other requirements for spiritual advancement can be supplied. Second paragraph. So here it said that from sound, ether become, became manifest during the process of creation. And air came from the ether. Prabhupada says, that will be explained later. Mm -hmm. But sound is the cause of the sky, and sky is the cause of shrotram, or the air. The air is the first sense for receiving knowledge. Yes, either material or spiritual. You have to give oral reception. So therefore, shrotram is very important. And Prabhupada makes the point, Vedic knowledge is called Shruti, knowledge received by hearing. And by hearing only can we have access to either material or spiritual enjoyment. So Prabhupada goes on to, there's a third paragraph. In the material world, we manufacture many things for our comfort simply by hearing. Yeah, the things are already there, but just by hearing, just by hearing, one can transform them. Prabhupada gives the example, if we want to build big sky sky skyscraper, doesn't mean we have to create it from zero. The materials for the skyscraper, wood, metal, earth, etc., they're already there. So, but, but if we make our intimate relationship with those already created material elements by, uh, oh no, but we, we make our intimate relationship with those already created material elements by hearing how to utilize them. Krishna, Krishna. It's pretty deep, isn't it? So Prabhupada goes on, that modern economic advancement for creation is also a product of hearing. And similarly, one can create a favorable field of spiritual activities by hearing from the right source hearing in parampara, hearing from Krishna, like this. Um, and Prabhupada gives the example of Arjuna, that Arjuna was in material consciousness and was suffering in bod the bodily concept, but simply by hearing, 
simply by hearing Arjuna became a spiritualized Krishna conscious person. Therefore, hearing is very important and that hearing is produced from the sky or the ether. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, the principle of hearing to properly utilize uh, preconceived materials is applicable to spiritual paraphernalia as well. We must hear from the proper spiritual source. Hare Krishna, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.